Part 2. Refining Assumptions in the Energy Page In the previous part of this video, I used the Virtual Energy Analyzer to prepare a pre-feasibility analysis of a hydro project. But that simple analysis was little more than a guess. I picked a 50% capacity factor out of thin air. In this part of the video, I'll show how RATScreen can calculate the capacity factor and project capacity based on a specification of the hydro resource available. For a hydropower project, the power available to be converted into electricity is determined by two things, the flow and the head. The flow is generally specified as a volume of water passing through the project per unit of time. This volume of water is falling through a vertical distance, which is the head. The higher the head, the more work gravity does on each molecule of water. The greater the flow, the more molecules of water. Thus, the power is proportional to the flow and the head. I earlier said that this is a run of river project. This means that the flow into the project will not be buffered by a large upstream reservoir. Rather, the project will need to use the flow available in the river when that flow is available. For most water courses, the flow will vary over the course of the year, with very strong flows when snowpack melts or during a rainy season, and lower flows at other times. I need to tell RETScreen the head, the mean flow on an annual basis, and information that describes how the flow varies around the mean over the course of the year. If I'm only interested in the annual production of electricity, I don't really care when the flow is strong and when it is weak. I just want to know, for any given flow rate, what fraction of an average year the available flow will match the given flow rate. In the hydro industry, this is often specified through a so-called flow duration curve. Here's an example of a flow duration curve. On the vertical axis, we have the volume flow rate in cubic meters per second. The highest value attained by the curve is 8.5 cubic meters per second. That is the maximum flow I would expect to see. The lowest value attained by the curve, the minimum flow rate, is a bit under 0.1 cubic meters per second. The horizontal axis is the percentage of the time in an average year that the flow exceeds a given flow rate. So, for example, the flow rate of 8.5 cubic meters per second, being the maximum that occurs, is exceeded 0% of the time, and appears at the left. Similarly, a flow rate of 0.1 cubic meters per second, being the minimum that occurs, is less than or equal to the flow in the river 100% of the time, and appears at the right. If we wanted to know the median flow rate, that is, the flow rate that is higher than that observed in the river exactly half the time, we'd look at the 50% value, or 0.62 cubic meters per second. Likewise, the 10% value of 2.4 cubic meters per second is higher than that observed in the river 90% of the time, and similarly for any point in the flow duration curve. A flow duration curve is an essential element of a hydro resource assessment. Ideally, it will be produced from a long-term series of regular measurements of the flow in the river. Where measurements are not available, the flow duration curve may be based on estimates of the mean flow and the generalized shape of the curve as observed in rivers with similar characteristics. A variation of this approach applicable to Canada will be shown in part 4 of this video. For now, however, I will simply assume that I have been provided with the data for a flow duration curve. I'll have to enter this manually into RET screen. The mean flow is 70 cubic meters per second, the maximum 645 cubic meters per second, and the minimum 10 cubic meters per second. The other piece of information I'll need is the change in elevation at the site. I'm going to assume that this is 80 meters. On the energy page, I'm no longer satisfied to merely guess at the capacity factor. I want to calculate it based on the flow duration curve and head that I have been given. To do this, I'll change to a level 2 analysis. I indicated earlier that this is a run of river project, that is, a project lacking sufficient upstream storage to permit flexibility or choice in the flow used by the turbines. Reservoirs permit flow to be used when it is most advantageous, but tend to have higher civil works costs and environmental impacts. Run of river installations make use of the flow at the time it is available, regardless of whether this is when there is a strong demand for electricity. Their costs and environmental impacts are lower, however, and most small hydro projects are run of river. 
I'll leave the proposed project cell as it is. The hydrology method cell is where I tell RetScreen whether I wish to define the flow rates of the flow duration curve explicitly or whether I want to use a so-called specific runoff method. I'll demonstrate this latter method in part 4 of this video. For now, I'll set this to user defined and define the flow rates explicitly. The gross head is the change in elevation between the surface of the water at the project inlet, called the headwater, and the surface of the tailwater. The tailwater is where water exits the project. It is called gross because head is a measure of pressure, and the gross head does not account for hydraulic losses, such as friction in the pipe, that reduce the pressure usable by the turbines to generate power. I've been told that the change in elevation on site is 80 meters, so I'll use this for the gross head. The maximum tailwater effect is a way of telling RetScreen how the gross head is affected by changes in the headwater and tailwater levels when the flow is high, specifically when the flow rate exceeds the design flow rate for the turbines. If, for example, the tailwater level rises by a maximum of 3 meters during high flow conditions, but a concurrent measurement of the headwater level shows that it has only risen by 1 meter, then effectively the gross head has been reduced by 2 meters. This would be a maximum tailwater effect of 2 meters. RetScreen Help says that a positive value for the maximum tailwater effect occurs at most sites. We can understand this by considering that there is generally some storage at the intake of even a run of river project. This buffers the flow. At the tail race, where the water exits the hydro plant, there may not be a storage to buffer the increased flow, and it may back up. In relative terms, the effect is of most concern where the head is low. This 80 meter project is definitely not low head, so the effect is probably not significant. I'm going to assume a maximum tailwater effect of 2 meters. I could check later how sensitive my results are to this parameter. The flow duration curve will dictate the flow in the water course. For environmental reasons, the project may need to leave some flow in the water course at all times. This is the residual flow. I don't know what the requirement would be for this site, but I'm going to set it to 10 cubic meters per second for this example. This is the minimum flow that occurs in the water course right now, and just under 15% of the mean flow. For a real project, I'd have to investigate. Firm flow is related to the ability of the project to furnish a minimum level of power despite changing flow conditions. The flow through a run of river project, and therefore its output, is changing all the time. What if someone wants to know the minimum power output that the project can be counted on to produce with a high level of confidence? For example, imagine that the issue was estimating the maximum load that the hydro project could satisfy in the event of an interruption in grid power. One could test this by interrupting the power at randomly selected times over the course of the year and measuring the project output. If 90 times out of every 100 interruptions, the power level exceeded, say, 5 megawatts, then the so-called firm capacity that would be available 90% of the time would be 5 megawatts. The flow rate that produces exactly 5 megawatts of power would be the firm flow. The preceding example, while illustrative, is artificial. A bit of reflection tells us that there is no need to interrupt the power 100 times in a year to establish the firm flow rate that is available 90% of the time. We can read this directly from the flow duration curve. Also, interest in firm power would be unlikely to come from its ability to supply power during a grid interruption it has more relevance to power grid planning and design. For this analysis, I'm going to assume that the firm capacity that is available 95% of the time is required. I'll set the percent time firm flow is available cell to 95%. Since I have yet to enter the flow duration curve data, the firm flow is undefined at this point. The final part of specifying the hydro resource is to actually enter the flow duration curve. I'll temporarily skip past the hydro turbine parameters to the table below them and type in the values for the flow duration curve I've been given. Once I've done this, I scroll down further to the flow duration curve graphic. It is blank. If you are in this situation and wondering why it's blank, scroll down further and take a look at the available flow adjustment factor. This factor shifts the entire available flow curve 
that is, the flow duration curve before the residual flow is subtracted, up or down by a specified factor. This can be useful for adjusting the capacity factor in a sensitivity analysis. If I enter 1, then the available flow is multiplied by 1, and doesn't shift up or down. To shift it up by, say, 5%, I'd enter 1.05. Right now, the available flow adjustment factor is blank, which is interpreted by RETScreen as 0. Thus, my available flow is being multiplied by 0. No wonder I don't see a flow duration curve. I enter 1, scroll back up, and see a blue line showing the available flow duration curve. Next, I have to tell RETScreen details about my turbine. I'll assume that two Francis turbines are being used. If you want information on how you might choose the type of turbine, there is a selection chart linked in RETScreen's help. The long dashed lines show the conditions for which a Francis turbine makes sense. Our flow and power output are squarely within those limits. Selecting multiple turbines is more efficient when there is significant variation in the flow. One of the two turbines can be used during conditions of low flow that would lead to a very inefficient operation for a single large turbine. I need to specify the design flow rate for my project. This is the maximum flow that the project can make use of. Beyond that, excess water bypasses the turbines. RETScreen help provides a rule of thumb. For grid-connected run-of-river projects, the design flow rate should be the flow equaled or exceeded around 30% of the time. This makes sense. If the design flow rate was bigger, then the turbine would operate inefficiently most of the time due to low flows. On the other hand, if the design flow rate was much smaller, the turbine would waste a lot of the flow. Looking at the flow duration curve, I'll pick a design flow rate of 70 cubic meters per second. If I knew the efficiency of my turbine as a function of flow rate, I'd select User Defined for Turbine Efficiency and enter the data from the curve in the table below. Note that each entry in the turbine efficiency curve is for the percentage of design flow for the individual turbine, as indicated at the left of the table. Ignore the flow that appears in the column between the two. It is completely unrelated to the specification of the turbine efficiency curve. I don't have a turbine efficiency curve. Fortunately, RETScreen can propose a typical curve based on the type of turbine, the design flow, and two adjustment parameters. To use this typical efficiency, I select Standard for the turbine efficiency. I enter 2 for the number of turbines. For the design coefficient, I look at the help. It tells me that this parameter adjusts the turbine efficiencies to reflect the quality of manufacturing. I don't have information about this, so I'll use the default value of 4.5. Now I can see the results in the table below. The turbine efficiency column shows the efficiency of a single turbine for flows varying between 0 and 100% of that single turbine's design flow rate. In our case, the design flow rate for a single turbine is the project design flow rate of 70 cubic meters per second divided by 2, the number of turbines. The number of turbines column shows how many turbines are operating for flows varying between 0 and 100% of the project's design flow rate. And the combined efficiency column shows the efficiency of the combination of turbines for flows varying between 0 and 100% of the project's design flow rate. This can be confusing. The percentages in the first column are interpreted in three distinct ways, depending on the column in the table. For the flow rate column, it is the percentage of the year that the flow rate is exceeded. For the turbine efficiency column, it is the percentage of the design flow rate for a single turbine. For the number of turbines and the combined efficiency columns, it is the percentage of the flow rate for the entire project. Now let's look at the turbine efficiency that RETScreen has proposed. I can see this in the graphic below the table, where the double hump reflects the peak efficiency with either one or two turbines. I can get key information from the results that appear below the hydro turbine input parameters. The peak efficiency is just under 94%. This occurs at around 80% of rated flow for a single turbine. For the project as a whole, this occurs at 56.4 cubic meters per second. At flows above this, the efficiency declines 
reaching 90.1% at full flow. If I thought that this turbine efficiency curve was too low or too high, I could apply a quick adjustment by entering a percentage in the efficiency adjustment cell. I'll set it to zero, indicating no adjustment. Below the graphics, there is a section where losses beyond those reflected in the efficiency curve can be specified. Red screen's help is useful, both for understanding what these losses refer to and for picking reasonable estimates for these losses. The hydraulic losses refer to how the water passages resist the flow of water and therefore reduce the power that the turbines can produce. I'll enter 6% here. Miscellaneous losses include transformer losses and parasitic electricity losses. I'll enter 2% here. For the generator efficiency, I'll enter 96%. The availability refers to the percentage of the time that the plant is in such a condition that it can generate power, should flow be available. The remainder of the time, maintenance, grid outages, or equipment failure prevent operation. I'll put in 95%, a relatively low value, because this project may be affected by ice. The summary section gives me useful information. First, it shows that the capacity of my project is not 50 megawatts, but rather 43.7 megawatts. I'll update the project description with this number. It turns out that I was lucky with my 50% guess for the capacity factor. RetScreen calculates that it will be 51%. The project will export 196 gigawatt hours of electricity to the grid annually worth 11.7 million Canadian dollars at 6 cents per kilowatt hour. In addition to the summary section, a curve has been added to the flow duration curve graphic. This is the power curve, which shows the power output of the project for the range of flow rates on the flow duration curve. The plateau reflects the maximum power that can be produced and appears once the flow reaches the design flow rate. I can quickly use the cost database to enter the initial costs, and the operating and maintenance, or O&M, costs. I'll use the values for a 100 megawatt project. When I go to the finance page, the project still falls short in terms of profitability, but I don't set much store by these cost database values because for a hydro project, costs vary widely depending on the civil works. In the next part of the video, I'll look at how RetScreen can help more accurately estimate the costs.